a powerful song with a lot of theological truth in it, and yet so worshipful. You know, we did a whole series on prayer, but now that we're going to the book of Colossians, we're coming to another prayer of Paul's. It's a very precious thing to hear the prayers of a saint for his friends, and that's what we hear in this message, in this passage here. Uh, it may well be said that this passage teaches us more about the essence of prayer request than almost any other passage in the New Testament. The essence of prayer request from what we can learn, we learn that prayer makes two great requests. It asks for the discernment of God's will and then for the power to perform that will. There are no better things for you to ask for than these two. God, help me to know your will and he'll help me to know how to do your will. Let's read Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. And so from the day we heard, we heard of how you were doing, we heard of your faith was growing, we heard of all this stuff great about you. From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, full pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the in knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance, with patience and joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That's all one sentence for Paul. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So what does it mean to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? Well, the word knowledge is a favorite word uh, for Paul in his letters. The word is epinosis. It literally is two words in the Greek. The word epi and gnosis. Epi means full and gnosis simply means knowledge. So the two words together mean filled with knowledge. It means a thorough knowledge or discernment to recognize the things for what they really are. In all of the four prison letters to Rome, remember, while Paul was in Rome, he wrote these four letters that we've been looking at. There's an element of the apostles' opening prayer in every one of them where he asks for this knowledge of God. Philippians 1.9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Ephesians 1, 17. Remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom, of revelation, and the knowledge of him. Philemon. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Paul was very concerned that people had a full understanding of their, of their walk with God. Paul uses this word several times just in this one letter of Colossians. He speaks of increasing in the knowledge of God in 1.10. In chapter 2, verse 2, he has a desire for them to reach all the riches of a full assurance of understanding in the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. He says that in Christ all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in chapter 2, verse 3. Why this use of the word knowledge? Which means to have full, thorough, deep, and accurate understanding. Why this use? Why this word? Do you remember in my introductory message that I stated that the occasion for Paul writing this letter was to correct heresy and theology, to correct their theology and their heresy of the church? That the heresy contained elements of what later became known as Gnosticism. The Gnostics got their name from this word, Gnosis. 
knowing, knowledge. So Gnosticism comes from that word. The word epinosis was a favorite word of the Gnostics because they said that you needed a fuller knowledge and it had to do with what they were teaching. Remember, they taught that God is good and matter is evil, that Jesus was merely a series of emanations descending from God and that he was really less than God, which was a belief that led them to deny his humanity that the secret higher knowledge above Scripture was necessary to have enlightenment and salvation. So they were teaching all this kind of things. So Paul uses the Gnostics' favorite term to instruct the Colossians on what they really need to know. And what do they really need to know? They need to know God's will. They need to increase in the full knowledge of God. They need to have a full knowledge of God of God's mystery, which is in Christ. And they need to know that all of the full knowledge is found only in Jesus and nowhere else. So he's literally using this term to combat against the potential of Gnosticism coming into this church. To be filled with the knowledge of God, that is, to have a thorough, deep, accurate understanding of God's will, is the foundation of all Christian character. So how do we know if someone is filled with the knowledge of God? Paul, in this prayer, implies two expressions of the knowledge of God. The first is, knowledge is expressed through spiritual wisdom. He says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. The Greek word for wisdom is sophia. Wisdom is a head thing. It's the full grasp of the great truths of the Christian life. It implies a vital knowledge of divine truth. It's the practical know-how that comes only from God. Knowledge is also expressed through spiritual understanding. Now, the Greek word for understanding is synesis. Understanding has to do with critical knowledge. It's the ability to apply a proper response to any given situation which may arise in your life. Do you have the ability to apply the right response for everything that happens in your life? So while wisdom is insight into the true nature of things, understanding is the ability to discern the type of action that we need to have in order to achieve the desired results. So Sophia is theoretical, and Sinusis is practical. So when Paul prays that his friends may have wisdom and understanding, he is praying that they may understand the great truths of the Christian life and that they may be able to apply these truths to the task of making the right decisions of everything going on in their everyday life. Lord only knows we need that. We need to know the truth, and we need to know how to apply the truth into our life. There's one other word we need to unfold in this verse. Paul asked the Father that the Colossians may be filled, filled with knowledge. Now, this is very interesting. Remember, the word knowledge means to be full knowing. But then he adds another description of filled. Filled with full knowing. He's playing on words to magnify the idea that they would abound in this knowledge of God's will that they would have an abundance of the knowledge of knowing God's will. That's his heart's desire for them. In other words, the knowledge of the divine will is to pervade all of our life and our being, our thoughts, our affections, our purposes, and our plans. Paul can, <clears throat> people can quite easily master theology and yet fail in living. They may be able to write or talk about the great truths and yet be helpless in applying these truths to the things that meet their everyday living. See, the Christian must know what the Christian truths mean, but he must also translate those into everyday living. And that leads us to the second great request that Paul makes in his prayer. We are to be filled with the knowledge of God, of his will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that, 
so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in knowledge. So, the second request is to live worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way. Got to know that to live. First he asked for understanding of God's will. Then he asked for the power to perform God's will. And I, I hate to tell you this, but I will. Just a while ago, when I was back there, getting ready to come out, this thought came to me. Never said it before, but I think it's accurate. Too many people are trying to find God's will rather than trying to find their life. Let me put it there. Too many people, here's the way I worded it. Too many people are trying to find God's will for their life rather than to find their life for God's will. Think about that. Yeah. Oh, I want to know God's will for my life. Because says, no, I want you to know what your life is for my will. And that's what we've been teaching through our whole time about prayer, is that the real heart of prayer is to know God and to walk with him and to understand him and then carry out his will. There's nothing so practical as prayer. We pray not in order to escape life, but in order to be able to meet life. We pray not in order to withdraw ourselves from life, but in order to live right in the world with all the people around us and live yet the way we ought to live. If we're going to live a life that's worthy of the Lord and pleasing Him in every way, that life must express itself in four ways. And in this simple prayer, Paul expresses these four ways. He says, I want you to live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing Him. We do that through bearing fruit in every good work. This includes acts of worship, prayer, praise, etc., as well as service done for other people, referred to as deeds of kindness, and cultivating the Christian virtues, such as the fruit of the Spirit. William MacDonald in the Believer's Commentary wrote this. Here is a helpful reminder that although a person is not saved by good works, he must certainly be saved for good works. Sometimes in emphasizing the utter worthlessness of good works in the salvation of souls, we may create the impression that Christians do not believe in good works. Nothing could be further from the truth. We learn from Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. And again, Paul wrote to Titus, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to, constant, to, to affirm constantly to those who have believed in God, that those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works. He said, Titus, I want you to teach over and over again to your people. They're saved not by works, but they must be careful to be sure they stay in a life of good works. So it's such a crucial part that we would live a life in order to please God, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and to please Him, that we are focused on bearing good works. The second thing that we would do to please God and to live a life worthy is through increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, the word increasing is a present tense verb. Uh, it's a continuous action. Growing continually might be an idea of expresses the meaning. So before one has a desire to know God's will, he must also have a desire to know God himself. And that goes back to this. Does I want to know God's will for my life? No, I want to know God. And I want to know my life for his will. There are so many self-help books out there trying to help you figure out how to be the Christian you ought to be. And so many of them are so focused on how you bring God into your life. When the scriptures say what you want to do is bring your life into God's life. Proverbs 9.10, Paul expresses the desire to know God's will. You must first know him. He writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The third aspect of how we might walk with him, be worthy, is through being strengthened in all power, with all power, according to his glorious might. The word strengthen is a present tense verb also, like bearing fruit and like increasing. Psalm 
So if we need to be strengthened, it means that God doesn't just pour his power into us and there it is. No, it's present tense, it means, means a continual thing. What I'm trying to say is that God empowers us as we need it and as we seek him. There's no limit to this resource, but you don't just have it and there it is. You must constantly be continually seeking to be strengthened in this knowledge of the Lord and in the power for God to give you to live the way he wants you to live. We don't live the Christian life out of our own power. Paul stresses that his will and God's power work together when he says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's through Christ's power, yet my will is connected to his power. Paul lists three ways that Christ's power expresses itself in our lives. All this is in this one little passage. How does, how does Christ express his power in our lives? First, by expressing great endurance. This has to do with circumstances. It's the ability to deal triumphantly with anything that can happen to us. That's part of what we need to have happen. That we're strengthened by his power in order to endure and right now, what are we trying to endure more than anything else that's happening to us? It's called COVID. It's literally the struggle of our lifetime. The struggle for how churches can be what they ought to be. Uh, the struggle for the Supreme Court to say, no, you can't say that the churches can't gather together. It's a battle that we're in right now. It's the greatest struggle of our lifetime is how the church is going to be able to continue to be effective in the midst of all that's going on. It's a struggle we're all having, however we do it in our personal lives. Many of us have friends and loved ones that are sick and ill and, or maybe recovering, but we're, we're going through this thing or even lost them. It's all the struggle. And yet we need to have an endurance to be able to walk through this. Nothing I've thrown them at me that I cannot overcome in Christ. And then we also express his power through patience. The Greek word is a combination of two words, long and suffering. In fact, King James uses the word long suffering, which is this literal right out of the Greek. Now, if you've ever had to put up with a high maintenance person, which some people say I am, you would understand the need and the challenge for long suffering. The basic meaning is patience with people. Endurance is with circumstances. Patience is the power of God to help you to work with people. Think about this. The Spirit never loses patience with us, belief in us, or hope in us. Amen? The Spirit never loses patience with us. He doesn't lose belief in us or hope for us. In His strength, we can have that same attitude towards all people around us. We don't give up on them. We maintain hope for them. Paul prays that the Christian may be such that no circumstance can defeat his strength and no human being can defeat his love. The last expression is expression of joy. The Christian is not to face life as a grim struggle with events and with people. The Christian is to have a radiant and sunny heart a sunny-hearted attitude for life. If, if, you're, if you're not careful, and I'm speaking to me too, you can watch so much news that all you hear is doom and gloom. And you can get wrapped up in that to where you don't have the sunny-hearted perspective that God is bigger than what's going on in this world today. So the Christian prayer is this. Make me, O Lord, victorious over every circumstance. Make me patient with every person. And with all, give me the joy which no circumstance and no person will ever take from me. Great prayer. Great prayer. It takes the power of God to express endurance and patience and joy. Recap, just a minute here. 
we live a life worthy, pleasing to him through bearing fruit in every good work, through increasing in the knowledge of God, and through being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, and fitting for the thanksgiving season through giving thanks to the Father. This is how we live worthy and pleasing to him. In order to live a life worthy of the Lord and to please him in every way, we must not only bear fruit in every good work, grow the knowledge of God, and be strengthened in his power, we must live in gratitude. Paul lists four areas we should be continually thankful for. We should be thanking the Father for these four areas that he's provided for us in Christ. The first one is for qualifying us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I don't know how that got there. That's the second one. But the first one is that we're qualified in the kingdom of light. What does that mean? It means we live in the blessings of God right now because we have that inheritance in the saints, for the inheritance that we have. The second one is for rescuing us from the dominion of darkness. Sin and Satan dominate this world. Paul described the work of Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He said this, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Look above that line up there that talks about delivering from the darkness. Above it says, we have a heritage of the saints that are in light, in light, rather than in darkness. Paul could never forget what Jesus has said to him when he struck him down on the road to Damascus. Paul says to him, Jesus says to Paul that he's to go after the Gentiles, to whom he says, I'm sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God or to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So the focus of all of that is to be turned from darkness to light and then live as saints that are in the light. And so we should be living a thankfulness. How thankful should we be that we've been delivered from the dominion of darkness? We see truth. We see, the, we see reality. We see beyond what's happening in this world. The next thing we should be thankful for is for bringing us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Our nation is still a democratic nation, but we are subject to a higher power. You and I don't live in a democracy. We live in a kingdom right now, and Jesus is our king of our lives. We need to remember that. This earth is not our home. We live under a king in a kingdom. Remember what the Father said at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. We can never forget that we live in a kingdom with the son that the Father loves. And the last thing we should be thankful for is for our redemption and forgiveness of sin, which comes to us through that son that he loves. The word redemption reaches back to the act whereby a slave is freed in the slave market. In our case, Christ has brought us freedom from the slave market of sin. And that's where this word was picked up from. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it comes, this word redemption comes right out of the idea of slaves being freed, and therefore we've been bought. The Lord Jesus has put a price tag on us. How much are we worth? How much did he have to pay to deliver you and I from our sin? In fact, he said, I value you so highly that I'm going to shed my blood in order to buy you, in order to buy you back from sin and from the slave market of sin. So since we've been purchased with such a tremendous cost, it's clear that we're no longer to belong to ourselves, but to the one who bought us with such a great price. And this idea of forgiveness literally means to be have our debts canceled. 
that has canceled our debt, which our sin had incurred. The Lord Jesus paid the penalty of the cross, and it never has to be paid again. The account is settled and closed. Redemption and forgiveness are not exactly the same thing, but Paul puts these two words together, and what we learn from that is that forgiveness of our sins is the main purpose of redemption. Why did he buy you back from your sin? Well, why did he buy you? And it was for your forgiveness of your sins. Remember, this is Christmas season, and remember when the angel came to Joseph because he was about to put Mary away, and the angel says to Joseph, go ahead and marry her, and then the angel says, you are to give him the name Jesus. Now, the very word Jesus means Savior or Deliverer. It's out of the same word as Joshua. You're to give him the name Jesus because his name means this, for he shall save his people from their sin. The whole goal of Jesus' Savior is to rescue us from our sin. How did he do that? He had to buy us through redemption. He redeemed us by finding the price of death on the cross for our sin. So he redeemed us for the purpose of forgiveness. Beautiful, amazing thought. Let's just summarize this prayer real quick. Just get the whole picture. Here's where we are. He asks that we be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So that we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him. In pleasing him, what will we do? We will bear fruit in every good work. We will increase in our knowledge of God. We will be strengthened in his power according to his glorious might. And what are we strengthened for? To have endurance in everything happening in our life. To be patient with all around us. And to be able to walk in joy. We're empowered to do that. In that process, what do we do? We give thanks to God the Father who's qualified us for what? To inheritance with other saints to eternal life. And the fact that we have delivered from the dominion of darkness, we give thanks for. And then we're transferred to the kingdom and are now with the beloved son. And in him, we are to give thanks for the redemption that he paid for our sins. It's an amazing prayer. And it's kind of uh, difficult to kind of break it down like this to see the, just the, the magnitude of thought that went into this prayer, to this statement that Paul made is just overwhelming. And maybe even listening to all this is a little overwhelming, but it's just such a powerful truth. I hope you'll be able to take the notes that you've got and go back over this and think more about the powerfulness of this prayer because it's a prayer that we should pray for our church on a very regular basis and for other believers in our church. So let's take a moment, and let's go to the Lord. And since it's the Thanksgiving season, let's give thanks to God and reflect on these ways of the Thanksgiving and Christmas season that we might be thankful to the Lord.
Well, it's such a wonderful time of the year for many of us for us to celebrate family and friends, and even though some of those adjustments have to be made right now, we, uh, we want to be sure that we honor you, that we live in thankfulness to you, and we, uh, we're just so grateful for what you've done for us. We, we pray, Lord, that we will grow and be able to know you well, that we live in the future. That we will live our lives not so much concerned about finding your will for our life, but to finding how our life might fit your will. We pray for guidance and strength that we might honor you and that we might be friends one to another, help each other grow and walk.